about five years ago, my family and I took what we called the trip of a lifetime. Uh, we saved for it and planned for it for years, and uh, then took about three weeks and went to Europe, uh, went to a lot of different places. But we spent about three days in Normandy, France. Uh, and all of us are big into history, so this was a really cool thing for us uh, to go there and kind of look at many of the different sites and places uh, where the Normandy invasion, often what we refer to as D-Day, happened. Uh, while we were there, at many of the different places we went, the same thought kept coming into my mind. And it was, what these boys did was really difficult. Whether it was the paratroopers who landed behind German lines, or the army rangers who climbed the cliffs at Point du Hoc, or all of the soldiers who landed at Utah and Omaha beaches, what they did was incredibly difficult. I have a picture here of Omaha Beach that, that I took. And until you're there, you don't really appreciate the size of that beach. 300 yards just from the water to get to the other side of the beach. That's three football fields that these 18, 19, and 20-year-old boys ran across while being fired upon by German uh, artillery and machine guns. And I sometimes wonder, would I be able to do something that difficult? Would my kids be able to do something that difficult? And as I was thinking about that over this weekend and thinking about what I was going to say today, uh, it really struck me that one of the things we want to do as parents is we want to equip our kids to do difficult things. Now, and a part of this is because living the Christian life can be difficult. There are times when you're going to have to have priorities that are countercultural. Uh, when you're going to value things that the world doesn't value, when the people around you won't understand you and may even accuse you of doing wrong or, or persecute you. Jesus himself said, the world will hate you because they hated me. You see, following Jesus isn't always easy, and if we want our kids to grow up and follow Jesus, we have to teach them how to do difficult things. And additionally, if we want them to be a success in life, then we want them to be able to do difficult things. And one of the most difficult things for them to do is to leave. That's why I think it's important for us as parents to remember that from the moment your child is born, your job is to prepare them to leave. Now, when you're holding that, that little newborn baby, it's hard to think that way, right? You're, you're thinking, I want to hold on to this little child as long as I possibly can. But when that child is 27, you're no longer holding them close. And if they're sitting on the couch in your basement playing video games, now you're saying, maybe I should have helped them leave. You see, from the moment they're born, we need to be getting them ready to leave. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child when they are young, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. This is the pattern in Proverbs. If you want your child to do something when they get older, you have to train them when they are younger. Now, my guess is every single parent here today would say, what I really want for my kids is I want them to soar. I want them to fly. I want them to do well in life. You see, all of us want to raise eagles. None of us want to raise emus. Do you know what an emu is, right? It's the, the big, fat, oversized bird. It's one of the biggest birds on earth, and it can't fly because its wings are underdeveloped. It, it, it's a perfect picture of what it means to experience failure to launch, right? It's an oversized adult that is underdeveloped. Eagles, however, from the moment they're born, their parents are getting them ready to fly. The little eaglets, as they're in the nest, uh, the parents begin to teach them to flap their wings because they want them to develop those muscles. And long before the babies are able to fly, the parents get them out of the nest and have them walking up and down the branch, flapping their wings so that they're learning, I've got to get away from the nest and I've got to build up my, my wings. And then finally, when the time comes, they start to take short flights away from the nest, but then they return, and they gradually increase the distance they fly until the parents say, okay, now you're ready, it's time for you to go, and they launch the eagles out to fly. That's what most of us want for our kids, isn't it? We want to be able to launch them out into life and have them fly. We don't want them to be an emu who says, I've grown into adulthood, but I didn't really develop, and now I don't know what to do with myself. This isn't a new problem. You know, parents have faced this for all the time. In fact, King Solomon observed this, and he had some words about it himself. In Proverbs 26, he writes about this guy that he calls the sluggard. Now, some of your translations say slacker. 
Sluggard is more fun to say. So we're going to go with that one today. All right, so Proverbs 26, verse 13 says, The sluggard says, There is a lion in the road. There is a lion in the streets. You see, the sluggard doesn't want to leave the house. Maybe he doesn't want to go to work or, or wherever else he needs to go. But because he doesn't want to leave the house, he's making excuses. In fact, he's now invented his own fake reality. I think there's a lion out there, so I can't leave. And he's making excuses. Maybe a good way to understand these verses is to think of them as the redneck jokes of Proverbs. Some of you remember Jeff Foxworthy and his redneck jokes, right? Like, if your cars don't have wheels but your house does, you might be a redneck. Some of you, some, some of you remember that, right? If someone asks for your ID and you show them your belt buckle, yeah, yeah you guys are a little slow this morning. Your, li your, line is, your line is you might be a redneck. So if your wife says, can you move that transmission so I can take a bath? All right, yeah, you guys got it. Okay, so these Proverbs are kind of like that. Well, what Solomon is doing is he's saying you might be a sluggard. So if you're always making excuses so you don't have to do what you know you should do, you might be a sluggard. All right, he goes, he's got another one, verse 14. He says, as a door turns on its hinges, so does a sluggard on his bed. So, so think of a door. A door opens and closes, right? That's all it does. It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't do anything else. It just opens and closes. Now take that door and put it on the bed. This is the sluggard. He just rolls over in the bed. That's all he does. He doesn't go anywhere. He, he doesn't do anything. This morning, super early, my alarm went off. I was like, oh man, I'm just not ready to get up. And I hit the snooze. I went back to sleep. And 10 minutes later, the alarm went off again. And I still was not ready to get up. And so I started doing some math. I thought, okay, so I've got to be at the church at this time. And it takes me this long to get there. I think if everything goes well, I can be ready to leave the house this quickly. So I can put the alarm on snooze for how much. Then I remembered what I was preaching on. And I thought, yeah, as, as the door turns on its hinges, that's me right now. So I got myself up. So, so if you're always late or you're always in a hurry because you spend too much time in bed, you might be a sluggard. Here, here's another one, verse, verse 15. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish. It wears him out to bring it back to his mouth. This might be the best verse in all of Proverbs. So we, in our house, we have these, these big jars of stuff, and one of them is uh, the, these little pretzel bites that are full of peanut butter. They have them at Costco if you want to try them. They're awesome. So I'll be walking through the house, and I'll go through the kitchen, and I'll see this jar, and I'll just reach in and grab a couple, and wherever I'm going or doing, I'll just kind of, you know, eat my pretzels and peanut butter. Now imagine if I go over there, and I put my hand down in, and I grab a handful, and I get that all done. I'm just like, oh my word, that was exhausting. I am so tired now. I can't even pull this out. As much as I want to eat these, I'm just too tired. And I just kind of lean against the counter, and I spend the rest of the day just standing there. All right, this is the sluggard. He, he is completely unmotivated. Like, not even the idea of eating the delicious pretzel bites motivates him enough. So, if, if you know what you should do, but you can't find the motivation to do it, you might be a sluggard. One more. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. The, the sluggard doesn't listen to anybody. The sluggard is a know-it-all. The sluggard's head is full of useless knowledge. And, and if you try to talk to the sluggard about what they might need to change, they won't listen, they'll criticize, they'll argue, because they are always right. So if no one ever corrects you about anything, it might be because you're a sluggard. Now, now these verses are fun. It's kind of fun to, to read these and say, yeah, you know what? I know people like this. I know this guy, uh, right? And, and sometimes I am this guy. Um, but, but, but this isn't really all that helpful of a passage, is it? It's very descriptive. It gives us a great description of the sluggard, but it doesn't tell us what to do with the sluggard. And if we've got kids who are the sluggard, we want to know how to fix this. Because if my kid is a sluggard, that means my kid is going to be an emu. I don't want an emu, I want an eagle. So what do I do to keep my child from being a sluggard? 
What do I do to keep myself from being a sluggard? Well, fortunately, Solomon gives us that answer. So if we go back to Proverbs chapter 6, this is another place in the book of Proverbs where Solomon is writing about sluggards. And listen to what he says, verse 6. He says, Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief officer or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? Right, we're back to the door on the hinges. Can't get out of bed. When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little, that, that's hitting the snooze, right? Just a little more sleep, just a little more slumber. A little folding of the hands to rest, right? I'm gonna put my hands underneath my head and lay down. And poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. Just real quick, what, what he's saying is the end result of the sluggard, the destination of the sluggard is poverty and want. And he says, and want like an armed man, which is to say uh, your want, your needs are going to enslave you. They're going to imprison you. You're not going to be able to get anything in life because you don't work for it. So, so Solomon's writing this to his sons, He doesn't want his sons to be sluggards, but apparently one of them was. And so Solomon says to him, here is the prescription for sluggards. Verse 6, go to the ant, O sluggard. Go to the ant and do what? Consider her ways and be wise. Now, by by the way, this is is a really good problem-solving routine, right? Look at something, figure out what the problem is, consider it, think about what the solutions are, and then do something about it be wise. So he says, look, son, go to the ant, look at the ant, figure out what the ant does and why it works, and then you be like the ant. So what does the ant do? Well, here's what the ant does. Verse 7, without having any chief officer or ruler, so that's no one to tell them what to do, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. The first thing the ant does is the ant is proactive. Nobody has to tell the ant what to do. The ant doesn't just sit around waiting for instructions. The ant knows what needs to be done and gets it done. So if you don't want to be a sluggard, it starts right here, be a proactive person. Don't be a person who simply waits and lets things happen to you. Be proactive. If you know what needs to be done, do it. Don't be a victim. Don't always have a reason why you can't do what needs to be done. Don't always have an excuse as to why you're not the one to do a job. If you know what needs to be done, do it. If you want your kids to not be sluggards, teach them to be proactive. Number two, the ant is proactive, and the ant has an eye on the future. All right? The ant is looking ahead. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Uh, one of the really good life principles from the Bible is to live in the present with an eye on the future, having learned from the past. Don't live in the past, don't live in the future, but have an eye on the future. You see, the sluggard doesn't think about tomorrow. I'm not going to get out of bed. Why should I get out of bed? And then tomorrow I don't have what I need. Why not? Because I didn't get out of bed. And the ant is always preparing. That's that's why it says the ant does what? She prepares her bread in summer. The ant knows winter is coming and wants to be ready when winter gets here, and so she's going to work hard now so she has what she needs then. She's got an eye on the future. So the ant is proactive, the ant has an eye on the future, and the ant finishes the job. Right? Look, look what it says, that the ant prepares in the summer and gathers her food in harvest. So when everything's ready, the ant goes back out and does the hard work to finish the job. This is a a really great pattern for us to follow just as people. If I don't want to be a sluggard, what should I do? I should be proactive. I should keep an eye on the future. I should finish the job. Do those three things. You will not be a sluggard. This is also a great pattern by which we can prepare our kids to do difficult things. If you want your children to be eagles instead of emus, look at the ant. I kind of think it's cool that to learn how to be an eagle, we look at the ant. Because sometimes in life, before you can do the big things, you have to pay attention to the small things. Before you can soar in the clouds, you have to get down in the dirt. So if we pay attention to the ant, we can learn how to raise eagles. So let me, let me talk to parents for a second here about raising eagles. And everybody else listen in because there's good stuff for all of us here. But parents, if you want to raise an eagle, learn from the ant. All right. So here's the number one thing you can do. Fill them with courage. Proactive children 
are courageous children. They're not held back by their fear. Often the reason we don't do what we know needs to be done is because we're afraid. Maybe we're afraid of failure or of disappointing someone. We're afraid of being ridiculed, whatever it may be. But fear keeps us from being proactive. So if you want your children to be proactive, fill them with courage. And the best way to do that is with your words. In fact, you need to encourage them. Uh, That's a great word. Encourage means put courage into. And the way you can encourage with your words is by focusing on potential instead of problems. If all you do with your words is focus on your kids' problems or their shortcomings or their failures, then they will not be courageous. They will be fearful. But if you help them focus on their potential, they will learn to be courageous. Something else you can do to fill your kids with courage, and this feels a little counterintuitive, teach your kids how to lose. See, this is, this is one of the great values of having your kids uh, be on teams, whether it's a sports team or a a computer team or a robot team or whatever else it might be. Learning how to lose is one of the most valuable things you can ever teach your kids. You see, when we lose, we have a wonderful opportunity to learn and to grow. When I was a coach, after every game we lost, I would sit down and say, okay, we lost because we didn't do these three things well. So we've learned something about ourselves. We've learned where we need to improve. And if we don't want to lose again, we're going to need to grow past these things. Your kids are the same way. Teach your kids that losing is not the worst thing ever. In fact, it's an opportunity to learn and grow. Now, this is sometimes hard for us as parents because we don't like to see our kids lose because losing is not fun. It's not. No no one likes to lose. And so sometimes when our kids lose, whether it's a a game or at school or wherever else it may be, we like to excuse the loss. Well, you lost because of the umpire or because of the referee or or you lost because you have a stupid coach or or you lost because your teammates are all bad. You see, the problem with excusing losses is what you're really telling your kids is you're fine, you're good enough, it's everybody else that's the problem. And if that's what they think, They'll never learn, they'll never grow, they'll never improve, they'll stay right where they are. You see, learning how to lose is critical for them to be able to grow. And if they can learn that losing is not the worst thing in the world, if they can learn that losing is an opportunity to learn and grow, they don't have to be afraid of losing. And if you're not afraid of losing, now you can be full of courage. And when you do lose, you can dust yourself off and get back up again and go again because you have the courage to keep trying because you're not afraid of losing. So if you want to fill your kids with courage, use your words to encourage them, teach them how to lose. It's an opportunity to learn and grow. Number two, uh, so number one is fill them with courage. Number two, choose your battles. Listen, if you want your kids to be like the ant and have an eye on the future, You can't destroy their future for them. Sometimes as parents, we get so frustrated with our kids when they mess up, when they fall short, that without even meaning to, we destroy them. Listen, your kids are going to fail because they're your kids, right? All of us fail. All of us mess up. You don't have to fight a battle every time your kids make a mistake. If your son gets a B in geometry, that does not mean he's going to end up living in a van down by the river. Okay? We all mess up from time to time, and we have to choose our battles. Remember the principle of deposits and withdrawals. If all I ever do is withdraw from an account, eventually that account is going to run dry. I have to make more deposits than withdrawals, otherwise the account runs dry. And if you want your children's emotional accounts to run dry, keep making withdrawals without making deposits. You have to make the deposits before you make the withdrawals. One of the reasons kids fail to launch, one of the reasons they quit and give up on life is because they're tired of being a disappointment. Because they try, and they try, and they try, and every time they make the smallest mistake, what they hear is, you are a disappointment. And eventually they come to a place where they say, you know what, I'd rather not try than try and be a disappointment. So it's easier for me to just quit. 
If you want your kids to have an eye on the future, you have to give them a bright future. And you do that by making investments, by making deposits instead of withdrawals. Choose your battles carefully. Let me stop right here for just a second. I know, I know there are parents who you fought the battles. You, you've tried to do your best with your kids, and, and now your kids have grown, and they have left, and they've gone the wrong direction. And, and now you're left thinking, did I fight the wrong battles? Did, did I do this wrong? And, and, and you wrestle with regret and hopelessness and, and despair. I, I want you to understand something. You can't control the decisions that your kids make forever. As your kids grow older, you have less and less control of what they do and what they choose. And so what you have to learn as a parent is, as I lose control over my kids' decisions, I need to rely on the one who's in control of everything. And I have to remember that my kids may make decisions I don't agree with. My kids may leave and run in a direction I'd rather they not go. And I have to choose what battles to fight then, right? Do you remember the story of the prodigal son? It's not really about the son, it's about the father. But, but in this story, the prodigal son comes to his dad and he says, Dad, give me my inheritance, which is a really awful thing as a son to do. Essentially, you're saying, Dad, I wish you were dead, so just give me what I'm going to get when you die now. And so the father, because he loves the son, gives his son the inheritance and the son runs away. And he squanders the inheritance. He ends up living in a pigsty. And the father just sits at home and waits. Eventually, the son decides he's going to go back home. And so he heads back home thinking, I'll go back to my dad and I'll say, Dad, I'll work for you. I'll be your servant. I'll be your slave. Just give me a place to sleep. Give me a roof over my head. Give me food. I don't have to be a son anymore. I'm happy to be a servant. That's his plan. But Jesus said, the father saw him a long ways off. That's so important. Because what that means is the father was looking for him. It it means the father was staying at home where he needed to be, waiting, scanning the horizon. When will my son return? And when the son returned, he didn't even get the words out of his mouth. He didn't even get to say, Dad, I'm sorry. Because his dad embraced him and hugged him and said, My son has returned. You see, parents, listen. Your kids may run the wrong way. You may not be able to control what they do. You may be in that spot right now. What you can do is you can keep your eye on them. And you can wait for them. And you can wait with open arms. You don't have to keep telling them they're wrong. Just tell them that you love them and that you're waiting for them. And you talk to your Heavenly Father about it too. All right? You know, I'd be remiss if I told this story and didn't point out the fact that all of us are that son, right? It, it, it's, it's not just the kids that run the wrong way. It's all of us because all of us have run from our Heavenly Father. And, and the beautiful thing is, as good as parents as we think we might be sometimes, our Heavenly Father is a better parent. And no matter how far you've run from Him, He's waiting for you right now. And, and I, I know that there might be some of you here, there might be some of you who are watching online, who are, you're running right now. And you're saying to yourself, I've gotten so far away from God, there's no way he would take me back. I've gone so low. I've done so much. There's there's no way back for me. And I'm going to tell you, Jesus told this story because Jesus wants you to know the Father is always waiting. And the Father's arms are open to you, and it doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter how low you've gone. It doesn't matter what you've been up to. It, none of that matters to him. God's arms are open and waiting for you to come back to him. And you can do that today. Parents, if you want your kids to fly like eagles, fill them with courage, choose your battles, and gradually release them. This is really hard. It, it's so hard to, to let our kids go, but the, the reality is as we gradually release them, like the eagles, getting the eaglets out of the nest, we're teaching them and we're empowering them to fly when the time comes. Sometimes parents are surprised that their kids don't leave. It's because their kids have never helped them leave, or they've never helped their kids leave. Look, if you want them to leave the house at 18, you've got to make them leave the house at 8. Let me, let me, 
Let me turn into old man, get off my lawn for a minute. Can I do that? All right. Hey, guys, don't raise your kids with screens. If you're wondering why your 19-year-old won't get off the couch from their video games, it's because you raised them with a screen. And that screen is as much a parent as you are. Get the screens away from your kids. When your kids are eight, they don't need a screen. Get it away from them. Send them outside. There's way better stuff to look at out there. Let them play in God's creation. Let them develop an awe for, for who God is and, and what he's made. You know, as, as your kids grow, gradually increase the distance between you. Send them outside to play. Give them chores. Give them jobs to do. When they do the job well, tell them they did the job well. Teach them the value of hard work. As they get older, sign them up for teams and clubs and camps and anything else that you can do that's going to give them an opportunity to interact with other people, like real live people, face-to-face -face interaction, because that's how they're going to grow. That's how they're going to be ready to leave. So, so, so continue to gradually release them. As they get old enough to get a job, help them get a job, right? Don't do the applications for them. Make them do it, but help them. Uh, give them the resources they need. Make sure they've got a ride. Make sure they've got a uniform. And please, listen, please, when your kid gets their first job, do not make it about the money. Sometimes they see parents who their kid gets a job, they're like, all right, well, now that you're making money, you're going to start paying for some things. Please don't do that, because what you're communicating to your children is, we work for money. That's the only reason we work, and, and money is the highest goal. Let them work to learn how to work. Let them work so that they can just be out of the house, kind of a little bit of independence while you still have that opportunity to have some control. And as they get closer and closer to that time when it's ready for them to leave, you need to start making an exit plan. Now, every kid's exit plan looks different. For some, it means I'm going to college after high school. For others, it means, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find a trade. I'm going to build a career. Some, it means they leave the house at 17 or 18. Others, it maybe they leave the house at 22 or 23. It, the age and the time they leave doesn't really matter, but make sure you have a plan. Make sure that you're working towards something. You know, for some, it might be a gap year. You know, sometimes our kids are getting close to graduation, and we're watching them, and we're saying, I'm not sure they're going to be ready. You know, look for gap year programs. Can, can I just tell you this? If, if you're a parent and you've got a kid in this age range, one of the best things you can do for them is send them to a Christian camp for a whole summer to work. Make them go work at a Christian camp. Here's why. They're going to be independent. They're going to be on their own. They're going to have to make mature choices. They're going to be responsible for what they do. And they're going to be surrounded by people who love Jesus who will pour into them, who will mentor them, who will disciple them, and they're going to make lifelong friends with other people who love Jesus. So if you have that opportunity, make that a part of your exit plan. You know, as, as a church, we're in this with you. We talk about this sometimes, that, that one of the goals we have for our, our student ministries, for our children's ministries, is that we are preparing every child and every student to leave our church without leaving their faith. Now, I know some people say, why, you're, you're training people to leave your church? Yes. Yeah, because the, the more kids leave our church, if they keep their faith, then the gospel's going out, and that's awesome. So you know what? When kids grow up and they graduate and they go away, we celebrate that because we know that we're investing in them that they can leave the church without leaving their faith. And this starts right at the very beginning. When we've got babies in the nursery, and, and some of you go in there, and you're rocking those babies, we're teaching them this is a safe place. This is a place where you're going to be loved by people. You're going to be loved by God. And as they get older, we, we teach them in, in energetic, in creative ways so that they know the stories of the Bible. They know who God is. I love that we've got this Bible Bucks store thing where kids who are learning God's Word, they get rewarded for that because we want to prepare them to leave, even when they're in first grade, second grade. As they get older, we begin to give them opportunities to explore faith so that they can learn to develop their own faith instead of clinging to their parents' faith. And as they get into high school, we're giving them opportunities to explore the tough questions about their faith, so that when they have those tough questions out in the world, they will be ready to give an answer. This is what we're doing as a church. This is what, what you're doing as a church, because all of you who invest in this ministry, that's what we're doing to get our kids ready to go. Last Sunday, we talked about being intentional parents. We're going to keep coming back to that phrase because it, it's so important. And, and today, as we think about 
raising kids and equipping kids to do difficult things, to be eagles instead of emus, we again have to ask ourselves the question, how can I be intentional about this? So parents, what can you do today? What can you do this week to begin empowering your kids to be proactive, to have an eye on the future, to be someone who finishes things? How can you fill your children with courage? What, what can you do to choose the right battles that will help them grow into people who love Jesus and follow Jesus for their whole lives? What are the intentional steps that you'll take? And you know, for all of us, there's this, this question of what am I going to do intentionally so that I'm not a spiritual sluggard? You see, sometimes we can be spiritual sluggards. We know the right thing to do, but we kind of come up with excuses and reasons why we can't do it. We just can't seem to find the motivation to, to start doing this thing over here or stop doing that thing over there. Or maybe I know that the next step for me in my spiritual journey is that I need to go and have a conversation with someone or I need to work on my generosity or I need to develop more gratitude. Whatever it may be, I know what the next step is, but I've been a little bit of a spiritual sluggard about it. And so maybe this morning, that's the challenge for you is it's time to stop being a spiritual emu and start being a spiritual eagle. It's time to stop making excuses, stop being demotivated, stop having reasons why you can't do what you know you should do, and start taking intentional steps to follow Jesus more closely. Let me pray for you that you can do that.